He's a former lecturer and instructor at several universities and colleges, recipient of many, many awards, including the uh, President's Award of the Veterans for Peace. Uh, <coughs> please welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Bowman. Thanks very much, and uh, if you could follow my example and turn off your cell phones, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> well, thank you for coming out this evening. I'm going to do some different things this evening. Uh, first, I do want to apologize for my condition. Uh, I'm getting over acute bronchitis, and I'm afraid my blood cancer from Agent Orange is flaring up as well. So bear with me. And I may need some water at some point. Uh, <coughs> Hearing what has gone on so far this evening, I've got a comment. How do you choose your leaders? We've discussed that. And Benjamin Franklin was interested in that. When he was a young man, he went to an Iroquois powwow. And he asked the big chief, You've had a thousand years of peace and prosperity. How have you been able to do that? Where did you find the wisdom to do that in your chiefs? The big chief said, very easy. All the chiefs are selected by the crones, the old women, the grandmothers. There is where you find the wisdom. <coughs> And if the chief doesn't perform his duties to benefit the people of the Iroquois nation, or the tribe, or the clan, they get unselected. Moreover, the chiefs cannot take the tribe to war without the approval of the crones. You know, I think we've got a new system that we need. <laughs> The way things are going now isn't doing us much good. We have the best government money can buy. And unfortunately, <laughs> since it is bought and paid for, it doesn't serve us. It serves the big money interests. The robber class, as Cindy says, I tend to call them the global robber barons the same folks, the racketeers that Spidley Budler talked about. Benjamin Franklin, in that same powwow, Indian brave came in, just loaded down with wampum, dumped it all at the feet of the chief, going on, going on. And he said, well, every time we have a powwow, we uh, collect the wampum, and I distribute it to the chiefs of the Iroquois nations, and they distributed to the chiefs of the tribes, and down to the chiefs of the clans, and down to the families. Everybody gets, we make sure that there's enough wampum for everyone to meet their needs, so that there can be exchanges of goods and services between the people, and also enough so that everyone can be generous in their gift giving at our many celebrations through the year. Now this made an impact on Benjamin Franklin. A little light went off in his head. And later in life, when he had the opportunity to influence the colony of Pennsylvania, he made sure that they issued sufficient colonial scrip so that there was no poverty, no debt. Everybody had enough money to uh, make free flow of goods and services. And 
this colonial script was not issued as debt. It was issued debt free. Later, the colonial script was adopted by all the colonies. And oh, 15, 20 years before the revolution, Benjamin Franklin went to London to represent the interest of the colonies. And he was appalled at what he saw. Beggars on the street, homeless, impoverished, hungry, out of work people. And he asked his host, what on earth is going on with all of these destitute people in the streets? And he said, well, we don't have enough debtor prisons to hold them all. And Benjamin Franklin said, we don't have any debtor prisons in the There are no debtors in the colonies. Everyone has enough money. <coughs> we make sure of that. Well, Benjamin Franklin also went to Parliament and related this same story. Well, unfortunately, the Bank of England heard about it. And the Bank of England got Parliament, which they owned just like today and in our country now. The Bank of England got Parliament to pass laws outlawing <laughs> colonial script and demanding that all debts be paid in the British coin of the realm. Well, pretty soon, there was not enough money to go around in the colonies and there started becoming unemployment and poverty. Benjamin Franklin said after the revolution, you know, we could have put up with their silly tax on tea and the Stamp Act, but it was the outlawing of our colonial script which led to the revolution. You won't see that in your history books. Because the bankers don't want you to think that way. When our new nation was formed, Congress was given the authority to coin money and to distribute it debt free. Well, arguments went back and forth between various people in our government. Way back as far as Thomas Jefferson, he was challenged by the bankers saying, you've got to get government out of the banking industry. And Thomas Jefferson said, no. You bank business of business of governing. And Unfortunately, our country lost that argument in 1913 with the creation of the Federal Reserve, which is about as federal as Federal Express. And since that time, all money has been issued only as debt with interest to be paid. And each year, we taxpayers pay hundreds of billions of dollars in interest to the owners of the Federal Reserve, private cartel for money that was never theirs in the first place. They've never put a penny of their own money at risk. This is why we need local banks, common good banks, which we're starting to create, and local nonprofit credit unions that can issue local currency in sufficient quantity to enrich the people of the community. We've got to break free. Of course, I am for abolishing the Federal Reserve, of course. But uh, yeah. until that happens, our only other alternative is to try and make it irrelevant by taking away its customers. In the same way, the other sources of power of this robber class, the global robber barons, I call them, are the electoral system 